Merciful God, we, we know, know that, that you love us and that you call us to the fullness of life. life. But For all around, around us and within, within us, we see, we see the brokenness of the world and of our ways. When we, when we focus on that brokenness, our hearts become filled with doubt. doubt. And the doubt leads to fear. And fear leads us back to lock ourselves away, forgetting your call to love one another. Forgive us when we forget to care for your creation. Forgive us when we forget our responsibility to the needs of others. Forgive us when we forget to heed the spirit that is within us. Help us to see Christ and the people around us. Open our eyes to your peace. Amen. wonder at our hour-long worship services when so much of our experience can be summed up in one phrase, and that is that God loves you unconditionally. Be reminded of that today and every day. Amen.
And all the disciples are there, and the door is locked, and they are terrified. Jesus had just been killed, and they heard now that Jesus was back to life. That was pretty scary. And in the midst of all of this, suddenly, with the door still locked, suddenly Jesus is right there in front of them all and says, peace be with you. And, and they were so shocked and taken aback, they had to say it again, peace be with you. And suddenly, they, they were confused, and he shows them his hands where he was wounded, and they rejoice, it is Jesus. And he's bringing them peace, something they really needed. He breathes on them and commissions them to continue his work in the world. And they were so excited, and they couldn't contain themselves. And one of their number, Thomas, he was out. He was not with those that saw Jesus. So he was out doing something else. The Bible study people thought maybe he was getting milk. I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. So he comes back in, and all of his friends say, you wouldn't believe it. Jesus was just here. He showed us his wounds, and he told us to keep doing his mission work. And Thomas said, I don't think so. Jesus is dead. I don't believe it. until I see those injuries, until I see him with my own eyes, I'm not going to believe. And that's where the term doubting Thomas comes from. So Thomas didn't believe his friends, doubting Thomas. And frequently when we hear the term doubting Thomas, we think it's negative. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Well, we are Christians and we are supposed to believe. But I think doubt is good. Doubt shows that you're thinking. Doubt shows that you're thinking and you're open to all sorts of possibilities. And without doubt, can we have faith? Let us have a prayer. Holy One, we crave your presence. We crave your peace. Help us to remain thinking, critical creatures, and help us find faith in the midst of our doubt. Amen. <clears throat> Technical difficulties with human being here. I wish you all could have seen that because I had three people waving at me all at once. I felt famous. <laughs> This morning, we have two readings. The first is from Acts. It's chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Our Gospel reading this morning is John, chapter 20, 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his, his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was among them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my Redeemer. I like to write sermons, which is probably no surprise to you that someone who likes to write sermons would become a minister. I love discussing and learning about different theologies, experiences, ideas, and we do that a lot during our Bible study during the week. We delve into the material, deep into the Bible, searching our hearts and minds for clues, for potential answers to our questions. Questions, the words for which are difficult to even come up with. Questions we probably don't fully understand. And questions become questions, become questions. As Thomas grapples with belief, I think when we delve into scripture, we grapple with belief, faith, meaning. And I think that where there is grappling, there is doubt. I don't know, I think sometimes I really channel Thomas. This morning's sermon you'll find is full of open-ended questions and it's probably not very well tied up. Which is kind of odd because I love this passage and I'm really familiar with it. In my last existence, I was a frequent post-Easter preacher at my church, so I'm very familiar with Thomas. I'm struck by this passage. There are three elements that I'm struck by in particular. First, it's the beauty of Jesus' appearance to the disciples. I'm struck that Thomas remains with the disciples even though he hadn't seen Jesus and doesn't believe their story. And I'm struck, I'm struck that the disciples and then Thomas identify Jesus and the Holy through Jesus' wounds of the crucifixion. It's a multifaceted story, a familiar one. And it begins with one of my favorite scenes in the entire New Testament. The disciples are in lockdown mode. That's something I think we're all familiar with at this point. They're afraid. They're in hiding. And for good reason, their leader had just been brutally executed and tortured. The door is locked. No one can get in. No one wants to leave. And in the midst of all this, Jesus simply appears and says, Peace be with you. The disciples rejoice. I love this scene because it beautifully illustrates something that I think happens to all of us from time to time. Finding ourselves locked down, shut down, fearful, grumpy, unwilling to open. And then something happens. Martin Luther talks about how Christ can come and stand in our hearts. He writes, Christ entering through closed doors and standing in the midst of his disciples denotes nothing else than that he is standing in our hearts. I think we can experience his holiness in various ways. 
Maybe a friend calls from out of the blue. Or we hear the laughter of children. Or perhaps when we pass the peace during a church service, something breaks through to us. It gets to us. It walks through that locked door of our minds, our hearts, and frees us from our self-made prison. I remember a, a time I was doing street ministry. It was a Sunday. And I was chatting to a large group of people, and they were younger and tougher than my usual folks that I chatted with. They were pretty pleasant until one of them, one young man, very angry to begin with and troubled, noticed that I had a little Dunkin' Donuts card, and he demanded the Dunkin' Donuts card from me. And it was claimed someone had asked me for it earlier, so I was hanging on to it until I saw that person. So I said, I can't give it to you. I don't really have one. It's for someone else. And he started yelling at me. And he started through, I was, had handed out socks, which he took. It was a cold day. He threw the socks at me, continued to be very abusive and abrasive. And I said to him, please, keep those socks because it's going to get cold. I understand you're upset. Maybe next time I see you, I'll, I'll have an extra card for you. I'll try to keep one for you. Well, he wasn't having any of it. He continued to yell at me. And I could feel myself just sort of getting a little angry myself and maybe shutting down a whole lot. And I could feel myself shutting down, and I felt like I couldn't do anything about it. I just, all I wanted to do was get to my car and go, get a break. And as I was sort of standing there going through this, one of my regular gentleman came up to me. He was a young man named Dave. And he was a very tender and loving person. So he stepped up. He put his arm around me and he just gently guided me away, caringly. And he said, oh, just ignore him. I'll walk with you. It was a peace be with you moment. His kindness and care opened me back up. And instead of going home or pouting in my car, I was able to let it go and continue my work. I was able to understand the hungry young man as the wounded poor creature of God that he was, just like all of us. Dave really broke through to me. Jesus, having broken through to his disciples, shows them his wounds, claims them, brings them peace, then breathes on them, commissions them to do his work. So it's understandable that the disciples were excited to tell Thomas about their experience with Jesus. But Thomas doesn't believe them. Unless I see the marks on his hands and put my finger on the mark and my hand in his side, I will not believe, he says. I can't really blame him. So maybe instead of calling him Doubting Thomas, we can call him Honest Thomas. And one week later, the disciples were again in the house, the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them, but this time, this time Thomas was there. And Jesus says, Peace be with you. And he says to Thomas, Put your finger here. Put your hand here. Reach out. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. Jesus closes with, blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. Current scholarship dates the Gospel of John at around 90 current era. Many understand the story of Thomas to be specifically aimed at John's community and those that have come since, whose members have never, never knew Jesus. That is, they had to come to believe without seeing. I think now how we view Thomas culturally has changed over time. Thomas has been seen as a shameful character. He didn't believe his friends and therefore didn't believe in God. He's someone who didn't want to be like. But more recently, it seems that people appreciate his critical thinking. We admire science and reason. Thomas can represent that. Even so, I think we're not fully getting Thomas. So maybe instead of doubting Thomas, or honest Thomas, maybe we should call him misunderstood Thomas. 
but what is it we're not getting? Episcopal priest and Patheos contributor David Henson notes that a full week had passed between Thomas's famous denial, I will not believe, and when Jesus came for a second time and he cried, my Lord, my God. A full week. What happened during that week? Why did Thomas stay? Thomas is still with his fellow disciples, even though he didn't believe them. He must have felt like the odd man out. And I think this points to the type of faith that Thomas had in Jesus, or perhaps even more broadly, the faith he had in Jesus' mission and his role in Jesus' mission. Was it so important for Thomas to believe that his, his friend's tale, when his own faith, was that true? So maybe instead of doubting Thomas, honest Thomas, or misunderstood Thomas, we should call him faithful Thomas. And we should be reminded that this isn't the first time that Thomas went against the grain with his fellow disciples. Earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus and his fellow disciples received news that Mary's brother, Lazarus, was gravely ill. Jesus said, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you're going there again? Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also, that we may die with him. It's interesting to me that someone who is willing to go to his death with Jesus would then be typically understood as the doubter. And it makes me wonder about the relationship between belief and faith. I think for Thomas, it's a head versus heart situation. His head wants hard facts, guiding him from a place of insecurity based on his experience of a hard world. His heart, on the other hand, is the engine of faith, guiding him from a place of love based on his experience of Jesus. Thomas shows great faith by staying with his fellow disciples during his week of doubt. Thomas also remained true to himself. He didn't cave in. He didn't go along to get along. He named his doubt, and he lived with it. When I was still running a faith formation program, we had a delightful small group of confirmands. One of them was Mia. She was also typically our Mary during the Christmas pageant. But during confirmation, she was our Thomas. The confirmands have to read their faith statements to the congregation during a Sunday service. And I remember listening to Mia's statement and laughing to myself because after every statement, she said something like, well, I doubt, I doubt it. I have my doubts. <laughs> And she wasn't rude, but she certainly wasn't caving in to any pressure of saying something that she thought people wanted to hear, or what she thought people expected of her. I think we all appreciated that. When I think of living life in flux the way Thomas did for that one week, I'm reminded of my beloved peace-working friends. Faith is the basis of their work, a belief in a better world, and their willingness to work for it, even though they haven't seen world peace actualized, and they probably never will. When I think about how Thomas stayed with his community for that long week. It puts me in mind of how we exist as a faith community, how we believe and what we believe changes. It can ebb and flow like a tide, but here we remain in community, helping and supporting each other. When I think of that week for Thomas, I kind of feel like that week is my entire life. How wonderful for the disciples. How wonderful for Thomas to have this special experience, this special knowledge of the Holy. He experienced it, a deep intimacy. In the first encounter, Jesus breathes on the disciples. In the second, he invites Thomas to touch his wounds. How would that experience change my life? How would it change yours? 
Is it possible that we had that experience and not realized it? Over the years, an element of this passage has become more and more critical to me, and that is, Jesus showed the disciples his wounds, and that's how they identified him. Not through his face, not through a glow, through the wounds. Jesus didn't come with fanfare and pyrotechnics. He didn't ride up on a horse with a blazing sword. Other encounters of the holy in the Bible are awe-inspiring, frightening. Here, Jesus came after his death and resurrection, offering peace, bearing his wounds. There's a kind of vulnerability there, and that resonates with me. Perhaps one way we identify the holy is through each other's wounds. That is, when you see and show compassion for another's wounds, it connects you to the holy in a special way. It puts me in mind of the parable from the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is telling the story of the king's judgment. He says, I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the people say, when were you sick? When did we visit you in prison? Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. So much of today's world is about creating fear, keeping us in our own little blocked rooms. And that's even before there was COVID. And this intense isolating of 2020, but this isolating movement has been happening. It was just more subtle. It's always been too easy to buy into the fear of scarcity where we must gather stuff and protect what's ours. That really became apparent after the toilet paper shortage and the food shortages of the early COVID shutdown, but it's not new. It just became on steroids. We're mesmerized by technology. We're screen addicts. And while this past year, technology has helped us stay connected, it also inundates us with a sense of insecurity, our sense of self, it's so linked to the numbers of likes we get. The terrible news of the day is played over and over again. We can't get away from it. Our self-value is governed by corporate advertisements which tell us we're inadequate. Lying will never be good enough. You can't be happy until you buy this or that. And we reward these liars with positions of power because they tell us they're all after your stuff. I'll protect you. We're engrossed by technology and media that encourages polarization. Don't be like Thomas in doubt. Just hold on to an idea and defend it to death. Otherwise, you seem weak and vulnerable. We lose our true selves. Our screen addictions, social media, advertising, we fear and we become prisoners in locked rooms, afraid to leave. This insanity has been enhanced by the American myth of hyper-self-sufficient individualism. Don't let them see you cry. And that's so often where we are. Distanced, going along to get along, fearful of the repercussions if we do step out of those locked rooms. And then something happens. Someone like my friend Dave suddenly appears, poor, abused, neglected, damaged, a lifetime of wounds apparent in his being. And in that moment, I'm in the presence of the holy, commissioned, reminded that the holy is always present. Amen. Our second hymn this morning also from the Pilgrim Hymnal, 222, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. It's actually 223. It's actually 223. <laughs> Oh, 
reminder, while we are still recording the service, if you have a joy or a concern you would like to share and have the congregation pray with you about, please let me know Thursday or Friday morning. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. O Holy One, creator of all and lover of all creation, our hearts are full of wonder, full of Easter hope, when we are still separated. May we remain connected through your spirit, and may we be reminded that you are always near, O God of peace.